Freedom. It isn't free, it isn't cheap, it isn't easy to maintain, and it often is uncomfortable to maintain. In the last few years, a lot of people have looked for freedom and a lot of people have went for what's been easy. But I think at the same time, the global barometer is moving. We're gonna look at that today and much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Create Your Own Life Show. I am your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the CEO of Command Your Brand, and we help individuals to combat cancel culture by placing them on the right podcast and new media. You can grab my new number one PR book over at bestpodcastbook.com. Also, a reminder as you're jumping into this video to like, comment, and smash that subscribe button if you support liberty, freedom, and want to create a better future. And the guest we have today, I had the pleasure of being on his show recently. He is doing so much to you know, help maintain and create freedom out there. Gareth Ike, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me, mate. Absolute pleasure. So for people that may not be familiar with you and, and what you do, man, uh, tell us a little about yourself. Um, well, I, I used to uh, be a footballer, um, and a musician, um, and then kind of, you know, I, I got more and more sucked into the fact that the world isn't what we're told it is, and that freedom and democracy are basically illusions, which um, wasn't the greatest kind of thing to discover. And then when um, COVID hit, it kind of, that became apparent for, for most people. And so really, for me, at that point, I have two young children, and I was like, Do you know what, I'm not, I'm not leaving this world the, in the way that it's going for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I tried to do as much as I could um, to to get information out there. And so I present a show on, on a channel called Iconic, a, a subscription-based channel, um, which basically tries to um, bring whistleblowers from politics and medicine and science and, and wherever um, to get them out into the public domain to make people aware um, of what's going on. Because um, for me, mate, it's become quite apparent that it's a numbers game. Mm-hmm. basically. And as soon as that that tilts in terms of the number of people that are aware of what's going on and willing to stand up and say no to it, game's finished. It's, it's, it's that simple. So um, so that's me. Um, and, you know, I, I make documentaries and, and stuff like that to try and, again, get information out there. But that's that's the number one goal, much like yourself, Jeremy, to be fair, mate. So so let me ask you this, because I think one of the the most exciting things in the last few years is I've seen a lot of people that I would say I'm um, politically opposed to start to wake up and start to come closer to, you know, belief systems I've always held. And I'm curious for you, what do you think is that thing that wakes people up to freedom? Like, what is that thing that makes them decide, like, I'm not okay with the status quo. I need to do something about this. Um, well, unfortunately it seems to be when, when people come knocking at their door, that's, that's, you know, I think that's why COVID was such an, a wake up call for so many people, because, you know, if things are going off in the Middle East, things are going off in Ukraine and the South China Sea or whatever, that's over there, like over the rainbow somewhere, like with Wizard of Oz. Like it does, that doesn't affect me on a day-to-day basis. That's most people's way of looking at it. Um, whereas with COVID, you know, it came to your front door. I mean, you know, pe- people were literally locked in their houses um, following, you know, when they could go out once a day, they were following arrows on the floor. So they walk around the supermarket the right way. Like that stuff is just insane. The fact that people even did that. So, um, so I think that was huge to wake people up um, because it affected them. And that's sad, but um, unfortunately, a lot of people are, I'm all right, Jack. So mm-hmm. actually, in a weird kind of way, the worse things get, which they are at the minute, the better it is long term because it wakes more people up. And, and the fact that most people, unfortunately, aren't willing to fight for freedom until they have the freedom taken away. Um, and that's what happened throughout COVID. That's what um, is proposed to happen throughout you know, climate change lockdowns and things like that, that they say are conspiracy theories, but, you know, so was the pandemic. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, so you know, un- unfortunately, it gets worse before it gets better. And, and it's it's sad because I feel like, you know, I've been trained a lot of times to look for um, what is the false flag event that's going to, you know, lead us to, to, to some other, you know, Hegelian dialectic solution they have coming. You know, it, it just always seems that way. And I think the thing that's been weird about how the pandemic, like, it didn't really end. It just kind of faded. And then we've seen all these other conflicts pop up globally. You know, we've had the war in Ukraine. We have, um, I don't even know what we call Israel. It's not really a a war. It's kind of a, 
It should have uh, stopped a long time ago. I don't know. I'm I'm Africa. <laughs> Yeah, but, like know, it should have stopped a long time ago. But I'll get called an anti-Semite, but it is a genocide. That's 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 what it is. People don't. So like so we we have that it. happening. We have like you know, there's talk of you know something could happen in Taiwan. We have things blowing up in in Kosovo, and it it almost seems like um, that different things pop up to get us off the target. If that makes sense, because people were united, and it's like okay, well now let's find something to divide them again. I'm 100%. curious your thoughts on that. Oh, that's absolutely part of it. The other thing as well is distraction, isn't it? You you know, at the end of the day, I, I think like if you imagine you're trying to work, you're trying to look at a map and you're trying to work out a way to get from A to B, the best route from A to B. You look at that map and you're working it out. But if at the same time I'm in your ear going, hey, what about going left? What about going right? What about going left? In the end, you will go, well, all right, mate, I can't concentrate. And that's basically what's happening. It's it's climate change. Uh, there's another storm. That's it. Bushfires, war in Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, October 7th, the, uh, disease X, the, the, you know, there's a, there's a new strain of the pandemic, whatever. It's literally just monkeypox. I mean, I have no idea what that was all about. I think that was trolling, if I'm honest. But they, it's one thing after another, which I think kind of stops people from thinking clearly. Mm-hmm. And also the one thing that all these things have in common is is they create fear. Um, and it's a, it's a fear of, because the, the only real fear I think most people have, or at least the most fundamental fear, is survival, the not not mm-hmm. living. That's that. That's fundamentally most people's fear is dying, and so whether it be the war in Ukraine or, or you know World War Three kicking off in the Middle East, um, or like you know China, like you were saying that kicking off them joining forces with Russia and Iran, another pandemic. Um, not that I believe there was one in the first place, but you know what I mean. Um, climate change, end of the world. They're all the same story, which is we're all going to die. And so that basically creates this real, you know, low vibrational state that most people live in, this kind of fear of everything outside of them. So it's little me. I'm My whole survival is dependent on them not pressing the big red button or them finding a vaccine that's going to save me or them developing a way to, you know, stop carbon emissions or whatever. These things are the narratives that we're given. So it's just a, a way of getting us to to give our power away. and. And the end result is always the same. It's it's less freedom and less money for us. That's the answer to all these manufactured issues. And that's where we find ourselves now. Is It's one after the other. And as soon as one fades out, like you made the point, COVID didn't stop. It just kind of faded, didn't it? Putin cured COVID. Simple as that. The day he the day he went in, then COVID disappeared. And then, you know, as soon as as soon as the narrative with Ukraine started dying, which it did, like and I saw it firsthand here. All the attention seekers and, uh, you know, um, virtuous folks, they all went on to Amazon and Google. Well, they Googled, first of all, what the Ukraine flag looked like because none of them had a clue. Mm-hmm. And then they went on to Amazon. They bought a freshly packed one and they stuck it up outside the house. Everyone did that. Loads I, I do still think it's pretty way. funny that the the head of the National Teachers Union here in the U.S., Randy Weidengarten, um, was actually photographed uh, putting her Ukraine flag upside down. So I, I did get a good laugh at that because she's like, Ukraine, but it's upside down. <laughs> it says all, doesn't it? It says all. But what started happening is when, when, when we had a real energy crisis hit here hugely, and it was blatantly obvious that Nord Stream hadn't been blown up by the Russians. So there was obviously more nefarious things going on. And people couldn't afford to to heat their houses and they sat there in the cold. Suddenly, these Ukrainian flags that people had in their front gardens, they started coming down and they started coming down pretty quick. And at that point where the support was gone, suddenly it was climate change. Bang. That was the, the new one that came thundering down the road. And as soon as that narrative started dying, suddenly October the 7th happened. Um, and as soon as you know the next one fades out, another one comes in. It's almost like a, an old school DJ just with two mm-hmm. faders. It's just like, okay, that one's done. Right, we'll bring that one in now. And it's just, you know, the the, the set rolls on. Well, I, I think that the difficulty in it, and I'd, I'd love to get, uh, there, there's so many directions we can go on this, so bear with me. But I think the, the, the difficulty in this is what becomes the overarching narrative then, right? Like there's all these narratives out there. There's all these different things you could do. <clears throat> And it also depends on like what alternative media you listen to. Like everybody yeah. wants to say there's one boogeyman underneath the bed doing everything. And and I guess when we look at it, I've asked this question so many times of so many different people and gotten so many different answers. Like, who do you look at as the actual narrative we should be following? Like, you know, is it the CCP? Is it the World Economic Forum? Is it these different things? Like for you, what's the most troubling narrative to freedom? I, I, I'll i be honest with you. I think they're all the same thing, mm. um, which kind of people 
find quite confusing and they say oh no no but 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 russia is against such and such it's like yeah on the face of it they are in the same way that george soros is opposed to israel on the face of it but uh, you know when when you get down to the nitty gritty fundamentally the the goals are the same and and the overarching goal is is control mm-hmm. that's what it is it's control of a population control over what you eat what you drink when you sleep what you think what you can say where you can go every single thing but what they do is if they, if they were to come to me and you now and say, hey, dude, right, I, I want everything that you own. Um, I want you to run everything by me before you say it. Um, I want control over, you know, X, Y, and Z. I need to take you off the land and stick you in a, in a, in a, in a high rise. You tell them to jog on. You'd be like, you're having a laugh, mate. I've got a beautiful garden, views of the fields. You're having a laugh. Why would I give that up? So then they create an issue. They create a problem. So they create a problem like climate change where, you know, we need to get people off the land or whatever. And then you know, you create an economic issue where people suddenly can't afford to live on the land anymore. Farmers, for instance, can't afford to keep cattle and what have you. So then they get the result they want in the end. But it's almost like they ask, they they create a situation where you ask for it. Mm -hmm. Like I always think the same with like universal basic income and things like that. You know, the, the World Economic Forum's idea of you will own nothing, but you'll be happy. On the face of that now, that's ridiculous. So if someone comes up to you now and says, right, sign over your house, sign over your car, sign over everything to me, so I own it, you you can still have it. Like You can still live in the house, you can still drive the car, that's fine, but it will all be in my name. Mm-hmm. You'd tell me to jog on. You'd go, you're having a laugh, mate. I paid for this house, this is mine, blah, blah. Okay, two years down the line, I create a situation where you can't pay your mortgage anymore. You can't afford to run your car. You can't afford any of this. You can't afford to heat your house. Everything's gone mad. You've lost your job. Everything's bloody... AI and robots now anyway, more and more industries are going that way. And then I come back to you when you're foreclosing and you've got the bailiffs knocking at your door and I go, I'll offer you that again. You can still live in the house. You can still keep the car, you still keep the TV that that guy's trying to take out the front door. You can keep all that now, but you sign it over to me. Tell you what, mate, most people would sign it off. Well, you know what's wild though? Is as much as people call it a conspiracy theory, like, like, dude, it's happened so many times in history. Like, if you look like, like one, so my, my master's is in ancient history. So I studied way too many things about Roman emperors. But if you look at um, the very first one, um, Augustus, right? You know, he's the adopted son of Julius Caesar and Rome had just been through a hundred years of civil war. And um, at that point in time, uh, Augustus is fighting against Mark Antony to basically decide like, who's going to be the guy in charge. And Rome had this office called the dictator. The dictator was somebody who would take office for six months. They'd make things peaceful and then they'd drop their office and it would go back to running as a Republican form of government like it was. So basically it was so bad and Augustus created peace so quickly that he then had this idea, well, I want to be dictator for life. So I'm actually going to tell people I'm going to lay down the office. So they tell me, to, so they, so they demand me to take it. And that's exactly what happened. He said, oh, I don't want to be dictator for life. I've brought you peace. And people said, no, 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 you need to rule us. And it's, we've done it so many times through history, man. Like, why don't we learn? Yeah, that's it. They create a situation where people demand their own enslavement and they, and they did it through, through COVID. Like, you know, when people stayed in their house or they only went out once a day or they, they wore a mask and all these things that they didn't want to do, they didn't do that for fear of the authorities. They did it because they were scared of what the neighbor across the road would say, or they were scared of some guy in the shop gobbing off at them in, in, a, in a Walmart or whatever. They weren't scared of the police. They weren't scared of Donald Trump, and Joe Biden, or whoever else. They're not bothered. It's that fear of, of essentially the other sheep. Like, mm-hmm. you know, my dad said it for years, like we've done away with the sheepdog. We don't even need that anymore. We literally kind of, we, we do the sheepdog's job ourselves on each other, you know. And, you know, for me, obviously it doesn't bother me. I, I won't go along with it. But I know so many people that did just out of fear of getting abuse. Like they don't want to have that. Of course, no one wants to get abused. And so throughout that period, I was saying stuff publicly because one, I'm sort of, un these will be famous last words. I'm sort of uncancelable cancelable in the sense that I work for myself. So it's not like I've got to keep my boss happy. Like I'm just a self-employed guy. I do various different things that I want to do. Um, and so when it came to that period, I was like, well, I've kind of got a duty to shout even louder because I've got people private messaging me that I went to school with or played ice hockey with over the years or whatever going, dude, I'm, I'm with you. I agree with you, but I can't say what you're saying because Mm -hmm. I'd lose my job or my mother-in-law's a proper wrong and, and, you know, all this sort of stuff. So, um, you know, that's, that's most of it is, is people's fear of what other people think. It's, it's not a fear of, of, of the army kicking down the door. It's, it's of, 
John across the road. Mm-hmm. And John's a prat, so who cares? So how do we flip that switch then too? Because I know, you know, I've heard you talk about this on um, on your show and also other interviews you've done that people often look to their influencers to decide like what's acceptable and decide what they can talk about. Yeah. How do we how do we break down that wall where people just start thinking for themselves? Because it's the crazy part about it is, Gareth, is that's the simplicity of it. If we just get human beings to look at a situation and think for themselves, it's all over. Like it's all over and 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 control is broken. Like how do we do that or what does that look like? That's the million dollar question, mate. <laughs> and that's the what that's the one I was asking throughout, you know, like I we're know. held down by threads, you know what I mean? Like that's the actual like we're we're just held down by thought. That's it. 100% and, and you know, I know I keep harking back to covid, but I only only do that because it was it was the most obviously visually a lot of prison bars that that kind of trap people are sort of invisible in a way. You don't really know. A lot of people don't realize that they're there. Whereas with COVID, they were, you know what I mean? They were literally bang, you know. So everything was was right in front of people's faces. You couldn't ignore it. But for me, like March 2020, they shut everything down. They shut all these businesses down now and destroyed these businesses. But the the answer was simple. It was no. So when the government came up to these businesses in March 2020 in the UK and said, we're shutting you down. No, you're not. Mm-hmm. That would have been the end of it, but that only works if lots of business businesses do that. And and what happened was one or two would say no. Well, they can pick off one or two, mm-hmm. and that's what they they were doing. They were picking off the odd one here and there, like Cinema and Co over in Swansea. They they make an example of them. I know there was um, a gym in the United States, a guy who who wouldn't have it, and they made an example of him and all this. Oh, kind he's of stuff. right here in New Jersey. That that that's uh, Ian Smith. He's right here in our in our state. Right, and so it's easy for them to try and do that. But if Ian Smith and 25 other gyms in the same region refused mm-hmm. you know and and that was that was evidenced in both Poland and Italy where well, I think that's also an important that. an important point too is it's also about like the authorities agreement with it as well because like so so Ian um is in South Jersey which is culture a little bit different than than where I am in North Jersey North Jersey's like you know very conservative um very um you know red up in this part of the state and the gym i went to they did the same thing they're like we're not going to close and you know what happened the police said great we'll work out there too so i think right. at the same time it comes to the authorities saying like you you have to look at this and say i won't enforce that lo- that that dictate you know 100% yeah that's 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 part of it as well and that's you know that's why when i was giving these speeches during lockdowns and stuff like that and people were shouting abuse at the police and it's like i was saying to people look that's not going to work. Mm-hmm. You know, shouting abuse at the police is not going to get them to see things from your point of view because, you know, most of them are in the same situation. You know, they're, then, you know, they're, they're okay. You know, they're, they're foot soldiers for, for, for an agenda, but they, they, you know, probably don't realize they're that, but they're, they're still only, you know, taking home minimal paychecks. They're still, they're still looking at the bills arriving on the doorstep thinking, Geez, how am I going to pay that? Like they're in the same boat as you. They've just mm-hmm. got a stupid uniform on. That's all. And so in the end, you know, I, I I built kind of I think I got called a shill for it, but I built quite a cool relationship with a police liaison officer in London. So we were giving these um the, doing these protests, and so I would I talk to this guy and I'd chat to him, and he he would come up to me every time. How are you doing, Gareth? You all right, mate? And I could see people nudging. Have you seen he's talking to the police? So like, yeah, I am because he's just a man. He's just a man, just like me and just like you. Um, and we need these people on side. And, and you know, that happens in places like France and Italy where the police and the firemen and whatever in Spain, they will refuse to go along with certain things. And and that changes the game. Like, unfortunately, we don't have that in the UK. Although I will say when it when it was getting towards the end where they were talking about locking down again for a third time, they, they bottled it. They totally bottled it because they polled um, – incessantly and it was clear that people wouldn't go along with it which is that's their worst nightmare because if they lock us down and people ignore it game's over and it shows the dynamic of where the power lies and and so the house of cards just literally just blows over so instead once they realized that people weren't going to have it they went oh no no you can have christmas actually yeah no we've decided we're not going to lock down it's like dude you haven't decided anything wait you haven't decided anything but at that point i remember we'd been at a protest and i was with my brother and this copper was there and they all looked the same obviously with their masks on and my brother just said to me, said, how much more of this, mate? Seriously, how much more of this? And I remember it. He just pulled his mask down. And he went, I'll, t- I'll be honest, mate, I'm fucking done with it. And he mm-hmm. pulled his mask back up. And it's like, you wouldn't have been the only police officer with that attitude. And if mm-hmm. it had gone on longer, you know, I think you would have you would have seen a bit of a turn and a bit of a change. Um, 
so you know i think it's important that we have these people on side and like you say that's that's great in north jersey the fact that the police did that that's magic if you appreciate the work that we do here and you want to support this show the biggest way you can do that is by supporting the products that we know use and love and that i recommend for you here on the show the first that i want to talk about is my pillow literally one of my favorite products the my pillow classic is what i use every single night it's handled a lot of my neck pain, a lot of my back pain. As you guys know, I've been a competitive powerlifter since my early 20s. I've retired from that, but I still take pretty good care of myself, and I'm still pulling some heavy weights as I pulled 500 last week on deadlift. And uh, our favorite product from we travel is actually the My Pillow Travel Pillow, and it's one of the things that we actually give to absolutely everybody. It is a great product to fall asleep on. So if you want to go to mypillow.com/cyol. They have some really great holiday deals over there. You can get up to 66% off of select products. Also, one of the biggest changes in my life over the years has been handling a lot of the parasites in my body. A number of years ago, I did a cleanse with uh, Dr. Jason Dean, and we removed these things called liver fluke from my body. They were actually eating my liver. It was kind of crazy. And every few months, I do either a parasite cleanse or his full moon detox that he's doing right now. So if you want to head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L and uh, grab some of his amazing products over there. I know he has a great holiday special going on right now as well. Support our sponsors. They help this show to continue and they help us to do what we're doing. And we could not do it without you. And you could do it just by uh, using the power of the purse and uh, supporting the products that we love. Thanks. Well, I guess the, the the question I would have then, because it 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 feels like in some ways we're winning, but it feels in some ways we're we're losing horribly, right? Like if you look at what's happening, um, you know, with with Millet, what's happening with Georgia Maloney, with ha- what's happening, um, you know, with hopefully Trump getting back in, like it does feel like there's starting to be populist sentiments that are rising across the globe. But then you know you you do look at you know what's happening in Israel, like you know I, I initially felt bad because I had friends that were there and and there was an attack. And at the same time, like that doesn't justify continuing this thing, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it should have ended a really long time ago. So it's like, I look at these other narratives and I'm, I'm really kind of let down in a lot of ways. How do you think we're doing kind of, you know, coming out of COVID and going into, you know, trying to restore freedom on a global level? Um, to be honest, I, I, I think it's not going to be done through politics. I've got to say, I don't, I don't see that. Like I look at, um, Maloney in in, um, in Italy, and she, I mean, she showed herself to be a fraud within about twenty minutes. In fact, it was one of the quickest I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, and then you know, and even Malay in in Argentina, it would be exactly the same. And you know, I, I just I don't. Well, my my me, reference to that is more of like the people coming for it, right? Like oh, enough, enough people yeah, had no, to vote it. for it in order. Like politicians, many times are frauds. Um, but like, yeah. I think the people are like, we need something different. Oh, I get that totally. I agree with you. The will, the will is there for change, like genuine change. I, I, hundred percent think that. I think the problem is, you have as long as you have a system in terms of politics where there's no accountability. So I can say to you, do you know what, Jeremy? I'm going to run for governor of New Jersey. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. When I get, as soon as I get in, mate, the same day I get in, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And that is going to put more money in your pocket. It's going to put more food in your your family's belly and all this sort of stuff. You go, do you know what? I vote for this guy. Mm-hmm. I've got. I I then have no contractual obligation to do anything that I've just said I'll do. I just come in and I could just sit there for four years and I could do exactly the opposite and there's nothing you could do about it. So do you think it's them or do you like, like, do you think that they get in there knowing that, or do you think they get in there and maybe there's, you know, an intelligence agency that says, Oh, you know, that one time you went to a hotel, we got a picture of you or something like that. Like, do you think it's, it's more of that? Or do you think these people actually operate that way? I think there's part of both. If I'm honest, I think there's certain politicians, people like say Tony Blair, for instance, like, you know, some people will do stuff for the money, like, and then you get someone like Tony Blair, who, I mean, that dude would serve Satan for free. You know, <laughs> he's not charging. I, I, I've said similar things about George W. Bush. <laughs> yeah, same, same, same thing, you know, and, and you can see those ones. Hillary Clinton, same. She, she, in fact, she, she'd pay Satan just for the privilege of, of, of doing it. Um, but then you have others, I think. That, do, that, do you um, remember the, uh, the Adam Sandler movie from the mid 90s, Little Nicky? I do, yeah. Yeah. Sir, it's five o'clock. It's time to shove a pineapple up Hitler's ass again. <laughs> yeah, that, but that, that is, would be that would be uh, Hillary Clinton. But anyway, <laughs> this is the thing, you know. But then I think there are others that maybe they go in with good intentions. You know, maybe some of them get compromised. 
some of them get shot in the head. Yeah. Um, if we're honest. Um, and so, you know, there's a little bit of that for me, a, a column A and column B. And I think it's, it, it's becoming more obvious, I think now, which ones are which. So which politicians are just kind of hapless puppets really that are in there that are just kind of, kind of, you know, getting a nice gig and I'll, I'll be PM for a few years and then I'll get a book deal at the end of it and retire. And then there's others that are there to literally serve the agenda and, and love it and enjoy it. And I think often that it's the eyes that give it away. You know, when you look mm -hmm. at some of these people and you're like, you know, like Hillary Clinton, for instance, I mean, that there's a demon in there, man, you know, and yeah. I, I, that, that's not me just slagging off someone who's a Democrat. I, I'm neither side. Like I'm not, either for me yeah. like i never i never have been like this is a weird thing you were talking earlier you said about people coming around to your way of thinking whatever yeah because i would say i'm inherently like sure i'm a little bit right of center but i'm more moderate than anything like i i don't i like you know i'm one way on one thing i'm another way another way on another thing i think i think that's how most people actually are yeah totally totally but we're, we're told we have to be in one or the other so and you know israel was a prime example you know, if you go, okay, well, I, 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 you know, I condemned, I mean, I don't like Hamas anyway, but they're funded by Israel. That's another story, but whatever. But so obviously on October the 7th, what the hell is that? That's disgusting. Message to mates in Israel, like guys, you know, what, are you okay? Are your family out of there? Blah, blah, blah. I was then called a Zionist shill, which was hilarious. And then the next day, you know, well, and, and I like too, like I, I had that initial like thought because like you don't want to see people die, you don't want to see th people happen. But with my first question to my wife, and I'm and I'm sure a lot a lot further down the road we'll know more about this. But like my first question to my wife was, Israel and Israeli intelligence knows everything about everything. Like how do they not oh, know yeah. anything about that? Like it just it just didn't make sense to me. But anyway, no, they they let them in, hundred percent. They let them in. But but just because you let someone in doesn't mean that they have to carry out the atrocities to carry out. But yeah, hundred percent. You know, the, the the army on the border was stood down. There's so many testimonies now to that, um, to to that effect that it's it's undeniable, really. Um, but then. But then obviously, then on the 8th of October, the bombs start and the 9th. And so then you start saying, well, hang on a minute. Like you're killing civilians here. You're killing children. Oh, okay. Now condemn Hamas. Oh, so you're on the side of Hamas. It's like, well, can I just be on the side of humanity, please? Can I just be on the side of innocent people? Like, why do I have to choose whether I want AIDS or cancer? Can I have neither? Is that okay? That, that's a really, really, really important point because it's, um, are you, um, are you, can, uh, do you know the concept of the Overton window? Like, are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. Where basically you're you're forced to pick one of two things, neither of which are that great. So like you know, if you at least pick one of them, you're pu push further to the extreme. I think that that's how often like a lot of our political arguments are made, right? Like you you know, Republican good, Democrat bad, or Democrat bad, Republican good, or you know, Israel bad, Hamas good. Like it's it's kind of crazy because that's not how life works, man. Life is no. a gray area. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Overton window shifted to such a point in the last, I'd say probably last 10 years, particularly. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of been moving around for a while. But for me, I was always a southern softy leftist, right? That's what I used to get called. My attitude was an, is an old school liberal attitude, which is, which is you do you, hun, right? <laughs> you do you as long as it doesn't negatively impact anyone else, then do what you like. Mm -hmm. Be free to do what you like, you know? So then that suddenly became a right wing viewpoint. Like you do you, what, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? Well, so you should be allowed to say this. You should be allowed to say that. Yeah, absolutely should, you know. So I went, as bizarre as it is, from being um, called Swampy, right? My nickname when I used to play ice hockey as a kid was Swampy because I had long blonde hair, dyed like, I wanted to be Kirk Cobain, to be honest. And I would, you know, wear a cardigan and I was kind of a bit sort of, you know, I'd stand in front of a tree to stop it being cut down. Like that's, that tree's 200 years old. You ain't cutting that down to build a car park. That was who I was, right? Mm -hmm. So I got called Swampy, who was a famous eco warrior in, in England who, who burrowed underneath a, a very famous woodland to stop them building a, a motorway through it. They arrested him and built a motorway, unfortunately. But, you know, anyway, so they called me Swampy. So I went from Swampy, the Southern softy leftist, right? To right... To, to far right, but, but my attitude is exactly the same as it was when I was 16. Mm -hmm. You know, I've grown in various ways. I see the world differently in other ways through light of experience. I'm 42 now. But in terms of having a liberal, like a genuine liberal, not a, not a democratic party liberal, but a genuine liberal. Well, attitude, they've changed the definition of it, right? Like if it like, like to actually be a liberal has a different meaning than how it's used today. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're not liberal for a start. Mm -hmm. in, in the slightest they showed that massively through through covid with with masks and jabs and stuff like that 
which is what's so strange about that. And it was so strange to me because people were comparing it to the Blitz and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And it was like, but if, if, if you can tell what someone's political persuasion is by whether they wear a mask or not, or whether they're vaccinated or not, that, that, that doesn't make sense. If you've got a deadly virus that's coming into your town, why would you judge that virus based on whether you were politically left or politically right? That doesn't make any sense. In the mm -hmm. same way that if the Luftwaffe was bombing London, you wouldn't go, that's right, I'm right wing, so I won't go in the shelter. I'll just stand out in the street. You wouldn't do that. It doesn't make any sense. Well, I think but a good example of this too is so, um, you know, I was like very anti lockdown, you know, very anti anti vax and stuff like that. And um, um, this week, my, my two year old brought home pink eye, which means everyone else in the house got it. Let me tell you, man, I am very anti pink eye. So I like did everything you could do to possibly not get pink eye because I wear contact lenses. But that's rational, right? Like that's rational. You look at a situation and say, okay, this thing is contagious as hell. I'm going to stay away from it. But like what you're talking about is, is irrationality. And I think people have really yeah. dug deep into that. Yeah. I mean, I, I just uh, spoke to a guy in Canada uh, literally half an hour ago. Um, and they're, they're doing an independent inquiry there, a citizen-led inquiry into the COVID response of Trudeau's government. Because obviously they've done the government investigating itself, which is always laughable whitewash. So they've done their own. It's like a kid and checking even, their own math test. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, they've given up here. Do you know that? Like they did the COVID inquiry here and stuff started coming out and they were trying to deny it and spin it to the point where they just got dizzy. So they've given up. They've actually canceled it. They're not doing it now. So that just says it all. But so this guy, Ken Drysdale, they've done an independent one in, in Canada. And he was saying some of the, he was telling us some of the stories of these people's testimony of what they went through. And he's saying like there was one lady in Winnipeg who went into the hospital. She's got a mask on, obviously, because, you know, it was all the law and all that sort of stuff there. And um, she gets a terminal cancer diagnosis, right? So she gets told there and then, you know, you've got however many months, not, not long. So she walks out into a local park. She sits on the bench. She pulls the mask down to get some air and obviously like compute what the hell she's just been told. She gets attacked by a load of people in the park. So she runs off. This is a woman with a terminal cancer diagnosis, runs off into a coffee shop, sits there, takes the mask off to drink coffee, gets attacked again to the point where the, the local radio station um, named her and shamed her for the fact that she w was irresponsible, not wearing a mask. This is a woman who's just been given a terminal cancer diagnosis. So it's like, you literally lost your minds. Like you, you literally lost your minds. And he was saying just this week, there's an article in, in the Winnipeg Free Press, I think it is, with where it's basically saying the the um, the the problem of the unvaccinated. Still, still talking about it like that after all this time. You know, the 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 was it like the othering of the unvaccinated? In other words, we need to shun away from them. You know, it's crazy that yeah. that's you know. And people, these are the same people that will stand there on something like you know. Holocaust Memorial Day or, or, or the, the, you know, D-Day or, or, or whatever, you know, 70 years since D-Day, whatever it is, and stand there and go, never again. We should mm -hmm. never allow people to be persecuted again. And they have their hashtag never again in their bio. And it's like, but you're persecuting. You're literally persecuting people based on their medical decisions. That's mental. Well, have you read, because um, this, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, the Holocaust. That makes me think of this. Have you read the book um, In the Garden of Beasts by Eric Larson? I haven't. If you haven't read that book, I would read it. Um, it's based on the American ambassador to, um, you know, kind of Weimar Germany, not 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 Nazi Germany yet. And it details a, a three year journey from him of like life's all normal to, hey, how the hell did we get here? And it's that yeah. othering you talk about because he just you, you you kind of look at his his daily. It's a lot of his daily correspondences with his family. And you look at it and you're like. I could see how this could happen. And it happens fast once it picks up speed, man. Like, I don't think people understand that. No. As soon as you as soon as you um dehumanize completely. And, and and you know, ironically, given the fact that it's Israel, the way that they dehumanize Palestinians, they call them animals. That's the same thing. It's it's because, you know, people's attitudes are, well, you know, I'll kill an animal, but not a human. Of course I eat animals, I eat meat. That's fine. So it's almost like subconsciously there is a little bit kind of Oh, it's only a dead animal. So no, no, mm -hmm. they're not animals, mate. They're human beings. Like, what's wrong with you? And they they did it the same with with the unvaccinated. It was you know we were a plague. We were gonna we 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 were the ones that were causing them to lose their businesses and be locked down. We were killing granny. We were doing X, Y, and Z. And so therefore, their attitude towards us was yeah, sure, give them hell. Mm -hmm. You know, Jordan Peterson style, give them hell.
So then I, I guess looking at that, you know, we've mentioned some of the other, you know, global politicians and how a lot a lot of them are frauds. You know, being that you're in the UK and you have a kind of external viewpoint, like how do you look at somebody like Donald Trump? Because I, I look at him like the Republicans hate him, the Democrats hate him, then maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Like I grudgingly voted for him the first time because Hillary Clinton is the spawn of Satan. And um, you know, mm-hmm. I voted for him the second time because I'm like, okay, he did a he did a pretty decent job. But I guess how do you being someone in the UK look at Trump and also what's happening to him? Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I judge people by their actions. So the fact that he didn't pardon Assange and he didn't pardon Snowden, but he pardoned a shed load of criminals um, mm-hmm. was quite was quite telling. Um, the fact that you know he moved the the um, the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, which was only ever going to poke the beast. Um, the fact that he had planes in the air to attack Iran if it wasn't for Tucker Carlson. To be fair, people seem to forget that. Um, and, you know, he bombed Syria, another sovereign country and stuff like that. So actually he's, you know, I judge by actions. So, sure. you know, do I think he's the devil? Do I think he's the worst president in history? And the fact that, we're, you know, we should all leave, you should all move out of America if he becomes president again, you know, like some people like go that far. But no, of course not. But I don't either. I don't see him as a savior either. I see him as a divisive character, which is what I think he's there for, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. I think he's there to divide America um, and to keep America divided. I think he plays, plays the role really, really well um, because you either love or hate Trump, mm-hmm. generally. Like, there's there's very few people that you'll talk to, you know, certainly here. You know, if you mention Donald Trump to someone, it's very rarely, oh, yeah, he's all right. It's either no, Trump's amazing, like he gets a bad very rap, true. Or, or he's the devil. <laughs> like, very true. And so you sit in one camp or the other. And so, you know, just by doing that, you're going to divide a nation. You know, very few, I think, Democrats, if Trump does get in again, will go, okay, fine, I don't like him, but he's in now, let's get behind him. They're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. It's not what they did the first time, did it? They, they tried consistently to undermine him the whole time. Well, there, there's also um, been a lot of talk around, you know, Trump and also around like the political climate, I don't know what you would call it here in the US, there, there's been a big narrative of civil war popping up. And I guess yeah. being somebody externally looking at it, do we look that unstable to the rest of the world or just kind of feel that way here? Yeah, no, you do. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. You do. Shit, man. <laughs> to be honest, mate, so, do, so does Europe. So does Europe. You know, it feels very much like, you know, everyone's angry, everyone's cheesed off, everyone's skint, everyone's desperate. Um, and you know, it's only going to take one or two little, little moments, little, little, you know, have you ever seen V for Vendetta? The film? Oh, absolutely. Great movie. Yeah. So, you know, the bit where he talks about it just takes one event and, and, and the guy, the fingerman, whatever he's called, he shoots the kid in the back of the head mm-hmm. and everything goes off. It's like, that's, that's for me, that's how I feel. Everything is at the minute that, that there's, we're literally one spark, one spark away from, from an absolute just inferno, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and like I say, I, I, I would, I would count Europe exactly the same, mate. And I, I even, you know, Australia, New Zealand, places like that, like there's a powder keg and, and I, and I think it's by design because, you know, reading 1984 and things like that, all, all, and same with V for Vendetta, everything that comes as a result. So this whole dystopian state, this whole police state, this whole big brother state, it always comes as a result of war. And, and a dreadful conflict. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what they want. They want everyone fighting each other. And then and then th- th- they then introduce the the response to that, which is a one world government. So you, you don't you don't have our, you don't have countries fighting each other, then you've got a one world government, you have a one world army, because then if you've got a one world army, that's fine, because who are they gonna fight? And then, and on the face of it, people go, Oh, that's great. Yeah, of course they're not gonna fight anyone. Well, yeah, they are, they're gonna fight anyone that disagrees with the one world government. That's the point. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's what I think they'll go for, this whole kind of global answer of, of we're all one place, we're all one people. And on the face of it, that sounds lovely because we are all one people. Mm-hmm. Um, but it but it won't be um for for the positive reasons that it's sold as. Um, and it's that whole old school order out of chaos, you know. I think mm-hmm. I think we're but I think we're in the chaos bit now. Well, and it, it goes back to what we talked about earlier um, with when, you know, Augustus Caesar became the first emperor. You know, the period when he took control of them was known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. It was peaceful for a very long period of time, but nobody really had any freedom. And, and I, yeah. I guess looking at it then, Gareth, like we talked about some things that are a bit troubling today. They can scare the shit out of people, to, to, to put it lightly. But I guess looking at it 
you know, what can people do? Like, how can they feel it caused in their life? Like, what what do you think people should be focusing on? So, yeah, yeah, we have this bad stuff that's happening, but at the same time, we can create something. So, I guess, what does that look like in your viewpoint? Um, I think people should be concentrating on themselves, their family, their health, um, what makes them happy, joy, being joyful. It sounds stupid I mean, to people. People go, oh, you sound like a crusty hippie, mate. But at the end of the day, most people live their lives bloody miserable. Find some joy. There's plenty of joy out there. And, and you know, that sort of is a bit of a finger up, you know, cue to the man, really. The fact that, you know, people can find some joy in their life and, 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 and build your community. You know, that was one amazing thing that came out of COVID, certainly in this country, was the stand in the park movements and stuff like that, where people just built communities, grow your own food you know, become self-sustainable as best you, you, you possibly can. I know that's not that easy for people. You know, if you live in a in a high-rise flat, you know, apartment, I get it, it's not easy. But that for me is is the answer to it, is is to actually almost detach from the 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 state, from the control grid, essentially. Just kind of step away from it, go like, do you know what? I'm not I don't want to be part of this. Like you can carry on, dude. You go and do what you like. But I'm 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 not having any part of it. That in itself, I think, would be would be massive, you know, for people to do that. And, and, and people kind of, this is the thing that I see all the time. And this is why if you say anything against Trump, they are on you. Like, it's like cult-like attack, you know? Um, and I think it's because people are so desperate for a savior. And I get it. I totally get it. The world's not in a great place and it's not been in a great place for a long time. So I That's also a really people... dangerous thing though, because if you're looking for so a dangerous. savior, you'll, you'll accept anything. Exactly. And, and, and the thing is, when you say to people that savior's not coming, dude, they, 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 are upset by that and they attack you for it and they're not impressed with you pointing that out because they see that as well I'm screwed then it's like no what I'm saying is you're the savior you're the savior of your own existence mm -hmm. and so people go oh you know well, what, what, what would you have without leaders we can have seven billion leaders you just lead your own life why do you need some guy in a red baseball cap or or some senile guy that sniffs kids to lead you I mean you don't lead be responsible take responsibility for yourself take responsibility for your kids for your family and for your own happiness you know and, but, but people don't people want to look for someone else to save me i need a safe space because hillary lost yeah grow up man people need to grow up that's you know as harsh as it sounds they do well, Gareth, I, I appreciate you coming on today man i know you're working on a lot of stuff over iconic uh you have some documentaries and things you're working on as well so you know yeah. what are you working on right now um and how can our, our listeners go check you out and support you man well, if you head to iconic.com, um, there's um, series, uh, films, and all sorts of podcasts and everything on that on that network. I, I run a, a weekly show called Gareth Ike Tonight, which obviously you, you kindly came on uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was great. Um, and so that's news and current affairs. But, um, but we're just commissioning two documentaries that I'm going to front this year. So I've just fronted one called The Body of Evidence, which is basically about the obesity crisis oh, and wow. how we went from size zero, thigh gap, you know, causing anorexia in kids to suddenly it's okay to, to be morbidly obese. Actually, neither oh. of those things are okay. And Don't so, go to the yeah. beach in New Jersey. It's terrifying now. Is it really? Everybody's yeah. 300 pounds. <laughs> it's, it's, it's everywhere though, isn't it? It's normalized. Yeah. That's the thing. And so it's a case of looking into why it's normalized. So we speak to cardiologists and doctors, psychologists, stuff. was interesting. But the two we're doing now, in the first part of the year, we're going to do one on politics, which is basically the history of politics. And, it, and, and because I, I don't have allegiance to either side, I can sit on the fence and go, right, what's politics ever done for good? And it's a genuine question. What what has it done for good throughout history? And let's look at it. Um, and then the other one we're going to make towards the end of the year is, is, the, is the history of war, basically. Because people have this attitude of we, we'll always have war because they, they fought since caveman time, so we'll always have war. It's like, well, how about we don't know? Um, you know, having an attitude of, well, it's always been that way. You wouldn't apply that attitude to anything else. Do you know what I mean? If 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 your daughter was being beaten up by her husband, you wouldn't go, yeah, but he's been beating her up for years. So I wouldn't worry about it. Anyway, do you want a pint? You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't accept it. So why do we accept the fact that these politicians can send our our children off off to die on a battlefield? Why do we accept that? Do you know what I mean? So um yeah, so that we're gonna make a documentary about that and and go all the way back, all the way back as far as you can go in, into history, um, and, and look at where where this bloodlust comes from. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Gareth, thanks. Thank you so much for coming on today, man. And we'll, we'll definitely, definitely have to have you on again in the future. I'd love to, mate. Yeah, it's been great chatting. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.